So I'm really excited to welcome Dr. Joseph Scalise here today. Dr. Scalise is currently a visiting fellow at the Sa Sui Hock Southeast Asia Center at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And he specializes in the history of revolutionary movements and authoritarianism in Southeast Asia with a focus on the post-war Philippines. He's a very prolific scholar since completing his PhD in Southeast Asian studies at UC Berkeley, my alma mater, by the way, where I did my BA, uh, where he completed his uh, PhD there in 2018 at UC Berkeley. He has published no fewer than eight peer-reviewed journal articles, including, but not all of them, I'll say just the most recent ones, um, in 2021, I guess forthcoming still, a, a deliberately forgotten battle the Lapiang Manga Gawa and the Manila Port Strike of 1963 in the coming out in the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies. Um, 2021, again, Cadre as Informal Diplomats, Ferdinand Marcos and the Soviet Bloc, 1965 through 1974. That's in History and Anthropology. And also in 2021, this year, the Geopolitical Alignments of Diverging Social Interest, the Sino-Soviet Split, in the Partido Comunista in Filipinas, 1966 to 67, in Critical Asian Studies. Um, he also has a book manuscript under contract with Cornell University Press. It's called The Drama of Dictatorship, Martial Law and the Communist Parties of the Philippines, which should be coming out probably in a year or so. Um, and a whole slew of book chapters, published reviews, and a lot of wonderful things for everyone to look up and start reading immediately. Um, I won't say more because we're going to learn a lot from the talk and hopefully we'll have a great Q&A after this, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Joseph Scalise to our virtual brown bag series. His talk today is entitled The Geopolitical Alignments of Diverging Social Interest, the Sino-Soviet Split in the Philippines. Please take it away, Joseph. Thank you very much, Eric. I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, address the audience uh, on a topic that I think is really exciting, which is to say the Sino-Soviet split in the periphery, not in the core disputants of the Soviet Union and China, but in uh, throughout the global South in particular, and the Philippines as a case study. Uh, the uh, listeners may have noted that the topic of the talk uh, the Geopolitical Alignment of Diverging Social Interests corresponds with the title of an article published earlier this year in Critical Asian Studies. I'm expanding upon that article towards uh, what is uh, a, a second book proposal that I've recently submitted. Uh, I have a forthcoming book with Cornell University Press, which I hope will be out next year, uh, on the subject of martial law and the role played by two rival communist parties, which I've entitled The Drama of Dictatorship. Uh, it's an extraordinarily heated and exciting uh, and terrifying development from 1969 to 1972, uh, as all of the various factions of the ruling elite are angling for, uh, one, in one way or another, authoritarian rule. Uh, and two rival parties, uh, two rival communist parties tied to Moscow and Beijing played a critical role in this. Um, and that's what my book documents. But it raises inevitably a question, why were there two communist parties? Uh, and not one. Uh, and why were they, what were their allegiances to this dispute between China and the Soviet Union? And that is what I'm attempting to explore in this talk and uh, in my second book, which uh, I have submitted the book proposal for, which I've entitled Aligned Rivalries, the Sino-Soviet Split from the Periphery. And the question that occupies me is how was it that the political rivalries in the Philippines and throughout the global south, throughout what I'm calling the periphery to this dispute, how was it that they aligned with uh, the interests of Moscow and Beijing, of the Soviet Union and China? Um, and I'm trying to avoid narratives that either imply that it was uh, the product of external machinations, effectively the argument of the right that these were agents of the Soviet Union or China, or what I find to be an equally a, a dead end scholarly, is that these were the product of domestic disputes and really had nothing to do with international communism. Uh, that, as I will demonstrate in a moment, that argument simply does not hold up. Um, so that then is the origins of this talk. 
Uh, and uh, I'm going to be examining the role of the Philippine Communist Party and why it was that it split along the lines of the Sino-Soviet dispute. There's been very little written upon this topic. Uh, the question of why in the 1960s uh, in 1966 to 67 in particular, the Philippine Communist Party, Partido Comunista en Filipinas, split in two. And out of this uh, emerged a new Communist Party, the Communist Party of the Philippines, CPP. And so while the names are simply Tagalog and English and mean the same thing, for our purposes in this talk, uh, the PKP, the Tagalog name, the older party, uh, is the one that allied with Moscow. And the CPP, uh, which still exists to this day uh, and is a strong political influence to this day, is the party that was founded in 1968-69 and allied with Beijing, with China. So the PKP and the CPP. But throughout the first half of the 1960s, there was but one party, the PKP. And the question is, why did it split in 66-67? What led to this? And how do we account for the fact that it corresponded to the Sino-Soviet dispute in a way that is intellectually satisfying. There has been very little prior scholarship on this. The most influential explanation was not even published. It's an unpublished paper delivered, I believe, in Canberra, the ANU, by a man named Francisco Nemenzo, Dodo Nemenzo, very influential intellectual figure, a man who was himself a, a leading member of the Central Committee of the PKP at the time, uh, and went on to become president of the University of the Philippines. And in 1984, he put forward this explanation. The schism was not a local expression of the international dispute between the Soviet and Chinese parties, but the offshoot of a generational rift between the remnants of an aborted rebellion, I'll get to that in a moment, and the new elements who were spared the trauma of defeat. So on the one hand, these remnants of the Hook Rebellion, which I'll talk about in a sec, and these newer layers, the youth, who came into the party and were spared the trauma of the defeat of the Hook Rebellion. That, he argues, is the seeds of the split. But since it occurred at the height of the Sino-Soviet dispute, what was a domestic quarrel assumed an international dimension. Neither the Communist Party of the Soviet Union nor the Communist Party of China were initially involved. Their interventions, which came later, aggravated rather than triggered the conflict. Now, I see Nemenzo's intervention in 1984 as something of a salutary contribution, despite the fact that I fundamentally disagree with it. He was pushing back against the standard narrative that put forward by the right and agents of the state and the Marcos dictatorship, this is still the reign of Ferdinand Marcos in 1984, that the split and the allegiance of the rival parties was a product of external agents, external machinations, that these were effectively agents of foreign powers. And he's saying, no, this was a domestic dispute. But it is not, I argue, convincing or intellectually satisfying on a number of levels. One, it cannot account for the extraordinary simultaneity of this, in which parties around the globe, in Latin America, in India, in New Zealand, in Australia, et cetera, all of them split within years of each other along the same lines. There is a sort of nationalist myopia to this argument that sees this as a domestic dispute. And so while the pushback against the argument of agents is a healthy one, the alternative that is posited, a domestic dispute that took on international coloration is unsatisfying. What is more, the idea of a generational rift does not hold up to scrutiny. Many of the older layers who had been tied to a peasant rebellion in the 1950s, known as the Hook Rebellion, which was defeated, many of these older layers, in fact, gave their support to the new CPP, allied to the Chinese Communist Party. And in the same fashion, the majority of the party's youth, who did not go through the sting of defeat, remained tied to the PKP, the majority, including Nemenzo himself, who was a man of the same youth as those who broke from the party to found the CPP. The argument doesn't hold up on a number of levels. Finally, there is the claim that the dispute was simply won over violence. This is not a scholarly argument so much as a common conception. The CPP advocated armed struggle, the PKP opposed it. This again is fundamentally wrong. The PKP had an armed wing just as much as the CPP did. 
when the armed wing carried out guerrilla struggle and bombings. This was not the divide. What was? What accounts for this alignment of interests between the Soviet Union and the PKP, the CPP and China, as well as with rival factions of the elite? And how do we account for the simultaneity of the Sino-Soviet split? I uh, am inspired in this by something that I was reading over dinner as you read other scholars from other fields. And I was reading Brodel and Brodel wrote in his book, Out of Italy, of the dialectic of the internal and external of the Italian Renaissance. And he noted that it is sometimes said that light shed from the margin is the best, that a complex whole may best be apprehended from its outer limits. In a situation in which every fact, every event has been minutely studied by generations of devoted historians, the vantage point of the periphery, of the diaspora, can provide new clarity to developments in the core. Now, I find this particularly useful for examining the Sino-Soviet split, uh, the development of global Maoism, the development of international communism from the vantage point of the core disputants has been meticulously analyzed. What I would argue has been seriously understudied is that this was an integrated international phenomenon and that the periphery, that is to say parties around the globe, split along the lines of the Sino-Soviet dispute, not as some form of collateral damage, blowback, an unintended consequence of a dispute between two national entities, but rather as a product of a, of a coherent, integrated international whole. And that by viewing the Sino-Soviet dispute from the periphery, we can gain new insight, not only into the disputes within the periphery itself, but to the development of global Maoism, to the character of the global Cold War and to the nature of the dispute between Moscow and Beijing in the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. At the core of my argument is the claim that Stalinism is, it's a number of things, this term, but among them is a coherent political program I think most commonly in everyday parlance, we associate the word Stalinism uh, correctly with the brutal excesses of the bureaucracy under Stalin and also under Mao, uh, responsible for purges, uh, for the gulag, uh, for uh, the revision and rewriting of history, et cetera, all of the things that we associate, I think, with the name Orwell, et cetera. These things are true, but I argue that they are necessary manifestations of a core political program. And by examining this program, we see that there is in fact a fundamental continuity between Stalinism and Maoism. And that Maoism, I would argue, is not something separate from, but is a variant of Stalinism under particular social circumstances. What then is this political program? Well, I break it down into four very simple points, socialism in one country, a two-stage theory of revolution, and the block of four classes. These were the programmatic nature of Stalinism. You can see here the artwork of the Communist Party of the Philippines produced in the 1970s that shows the block of four classes. I'll get back to that in just a moment to explain this illustration. Stalinism at its essence expressed the political interest of privileged layers of the party bureaucracy within the Soviet Union and after 1949 in China. Seeking to defend and expand the social basis of their positions, these bureaucrats put forward a nationalist program of building socialism in one country as the paramount political task rather than world socialist revolution. Looking to secure diplomatic and trade relations in service to the construction of their national economies, Stalinist bureaucrats sought political capital with which to negotiate with a ruling class in countries around the world. To this end, they rehabilitated the old Menshevik line of a two-stage revolution. They instructed communist parties around the globe that the tasks of the revolution in which they were engaged were not yet socialist in character, but were national and democratic only. A section of the capitalist class, they argued, would play a progressive role in this necessary first stage. So the tasks in this first stage of a two-stage revolution, the national democratic stage, still have a capitalist character. And therefore, a section of the capitalist class will play a progressive role. That's the argument. 
The goal of Communist Party leaders should thus be to secure an alliance with this progressive section of the national bourgeoisie and to bring the pressure and support of a mass movement behind their elite allies. Now, this is what we see in the illustration. This uh, is from a book on how to use drawing to instruct the masses. And you can see on the top layer, Malaka'awai, the enemies. And the enemies are Uncle Sam, the uh, imperialist United States, the comprador bourgeoisie, uh, that, the fat capitalist up top, and the landlord, Pangino Ongmailupa. But on the bottom, we see the block of four classes. And this is comprised of friends, Malakaibigan, Mangagawa, the worker, Magsasaka, the peasant, Petty Borgesia, some of these hardly require translation, that's the petty bourgeoisie, and Pambansang Borgesia, that is to say the national bourgeoisie. These are the four progressive classes and notice that a section of the capitalist class is by this definition progressive, an ally of the workers. A section of the bosses is an ally of the workers. That's the critical point in this first stage of a two-stage revolution. Stalinism was first and foremost a political program that articulated the interests of the ruling party bureaucracies before it was denounced by Khrushchev in his 56 secret speech of show trials, purges, and the cult of the great leader. At its essence, it was a program before it was these other things. These were the mechanisms routinely employed by Stalinism to maintain a bureaucratic hold on power, but they were not the essence of what was disseminated around the globe. The global strength of Stalinism rested on the appeal to a layer of nationalist intellectuals in countries of belated capitalist development of its core concepts, socialism in one country, a two-stage theory of revolution, and the bloc of four progressive classes. Many communist party leaders outside of the Soviet Union were drawn to Stalinism, because they saw this as a means of implementing national reforms. It allowed them to deploy the banner of Marxism and use it to win mass support for industrialization under native capitalist ownership. So the program of national reforms, national industrialization, the development of a sort of autarkic national capitalist economy, uh, very much a core concept of nationalist intelligentsia in the 1950s and 60s, required mass enthusiasm to carry it out. But how do you secure the support of workers and peasants for what effectively is a series of protectionist measures on behalf of national capitalism? It amounts to trickle down economics. If we can improve national capitalism, it will float, rising tide floats all boats. That sort of logic. I mean, this is of course long before Reagan, but that's the argument. And the answer is that Stalinism provides you can use the banner of Marxism, of revolution, et cetera, to dress up the first stage of a necessary two-stage revolution as progressive and an alliance with the capitalist class. Loans from and trade with the Soviet bloc were an additional measure of furtherance to these ends. <clears throat> it was for this reason that the PKP, as I'll detail in just a moment, gave its support to Ferdinand Marcos in 1965, proclaiming him the progressive representative of the national bourgeoisie. This is a year prior to the split in the Communist Party. There was a contradiction, however, at the heart of this Stalinist program. That contradiction is that it sought simultaneously to retain hold over a mass movement and to secure an alliance with a section of the elite. It sought to do both. It was inevitable that it had to do both. Its alliance with a section of the elite was predicated upon its hold over a mass movement. That was its political capital. Under situations of social unrest, however, this contradiction became increasingly unstable, hard to hold together. How do you retain hold over a mass movement and an alliance with, an, with the elite in a situation that is becoming increasingly revolutionary, increasingly explosive? And in the context of the 1960s, this contradiction at the heart of Stalinism tore itself apart, diverging social interests that found that the ideological form of the national dispute between the Soviet Union and China gave expression to these diverging social interests an alignment between this program and its variants with diverging interests at a national level. This is what I'm going to establish in a sort of the case study of the Philippines. <clears throat> Why, what were the variants of the Soviet Union and China? This is my last point under Stalinism. The Soviet Union and China were both committed to the construction of socialism within their borders and never merged their economies. 
their divergent national interests inevitably conflicted, giving rise to rivalry, then open split and armed conflict. The uneven economic development of the two countries and their starkly different geopolitical circumstances fueled the tensions between them. Situated behind the buffer zone of Eastern Europe and with a fairly stable industrial base, the Soviet Union followed a policy of peaceful coexistence with the United States and established friendly ties with autocrats. When Suharto rose to power in 1965-66, uh, as we'll see in a moment, the Soviet Union uh, met with Adam Malik, his foreign minister, and arranged for the repayment of arms uh, that the Soviet Union had supplied to the Indonesian state and that had been used in suppressing the PKI relations with autocrats. The China, in contrast, found itself by the mid-1960s threatened on all sides, facing an imminent threat posed by the US invasion of Vietnam, 1965, and the loss of its largest international ally, the Partai Komunis Indonesia, the PKI, again, 1965. And the Chinese Communist Party sought to whip up armed struggle throughout the region to defuse the threat of US imperialism to China's immense imperiled borders. While the Soviet government embraced Suharto, the CCP promoted protracted people's war and armed uprising throughout the countryside of the world backed by China, the Yan'an of world revolution. Now this was not universally the position of Chinese Maoism. This was put forward by Lin Biao in 1964-65, became the policy of the Chinese Communist Party in this period and was abandoned in the early 1970s as China reoriented and established relations with the United States. But for this brief window from 65 to 71, in the Lin Biao phase of Maoism seen from the periphery, we have uh, all of the hallmarks of what became international Maoism. The PKP in the wake of the defeat of the Hook Rebellion was at the beginning of the 1960s, a dormant political party. It had essentially disappeared from the political landscape as a result of this defeat. The reemergence of the PKP was a direct result of connections established with Indonesia. Here, the immensely influential PKI, the largest communist party outside of the communist bloc, played a critical role in the dissemination of the ideas of the Sino-Soviet split throughout the region. And I substantiate this in great length uh, in the book manuscript that I'm currently working on, the ties with, uh, with Indonesia, between Indonesia and the Philippines, and how this played an instrumental role in the dispute that shaped island Southeast Asia known as Konfrontasi in the period of 1963 to 1965. The Philippines actually was a core disputant, something that has been largely overlooked by subsequent scholarship, which has seen this as a national dispute between Malaysia and Indonesia over the formation of Malaysia. It was in fact a dispute over the social character of the entire region. The PKI through a graduate student in, uh, at the University of the Philippines uh, named Bakri Ilyas oversaw the rebirth of the PKP, bringing new blood into the party. Above all, a graduate student from the University of the Philippines named Jose Maria Sison, who will go on to become the head of the newly founded CPP by the end of the 1960s. Sison was not immediately, however, a dissenter. In fact, he was the foremost organizational force within the PKP, instrumental in their support for Marcos in 1965. He was a core figure in this, the PKP. The tensions that tore apart the party were not yet present at the beginning of the 1960s. One of the things that's most interesting, I think, in studying the Sino-Soviet split from the periphery is that the model of a sort of hubs and hub and spokes perspective in which Beijing and Moscow are the two hubs and the spokes reach from Beijing to Jakarta and from Beijing to Manila is only partially accurate. There was in fact a complex mesh of relations that ran from Jakarta to Manila, from Havana to Manila, uh, and from Manila to Japan, et cetera. Uh, these, the dissemination of the Sino-Soviet tensions spread not only from the core to the periphery, but throughout the periphery in a somewhat autonomous fashion. 1965, was not only for the purposes of my study of the Sino-Soviet split, but for the purposes of world history, a global turning point 
I don't think this has been adequately stressed uh, in studies of the 20th century where other turning points are stressed. 1965, with the deployment of US troops to Vietnam in March under Operation Rolling Thunder by the Johnson administration, by the end of the year, more than 185,000 US forces were deployed to Vietnam and the crushing of the PKI a slaughter of hundreds of thousands, possibly upwards of a million members and supporters of the PKI uh, in the uh, rise to power of General Suharto. Uh, this fundamentally redefined the region and world politics and precipitated an acceleration in the development of global Maoism, uh, the turn to the Cultural Revolution, shifted Communist Party allegiances, the crushing of the PKI was instrumental in the Japanese Communist Party shifting its, its allegiance from Beijing to Moscow in 1966. Uh, it also set in motion the events that led to the Sino-Soviet split in the Philippines. It was in the wake of 1965 that the Philippine Communist Party was compelled to seek out new international relations that were not mediated through Jakarta. In the same year, uh, while these events were transpiring, it was a presidential election in the Philippines. Ferdinand Marcos had recently jumped ship from his liberal party and joined the Nationalista party and was running as their presidential candidate against the incumbent, Justado Macapagal. The critical question in mobilizing mass support behind Ferdinand Marcos was the question of the war in Vietnam. Johnson had secretly reached out to uh, Macapagal in 1964 prior to the Gulf of Tonkin incident and said that he needed troops to be deployed to Vietnam for an upcoming surge in US troops in the region. Uh, he did the same with Thailand, Korea, et cetera. And Macapagal uh, declared that he would wholeheartedly send Filipino troops to Vietnam. Uh, this was going to be known as PhilCAG, uh, the uh, Philippine Civic Action Group. Yeah, it's a rather Orwellian euphemism for the troops being deployed to Vietnam. And Marcos in 1965 denounced Macapagal for doing this, claiming that Macapagal was an aspiring dictator, words that history would render ironic, um, and that he was a puppet of US interests and so on and so forth, and announced that he was opposed to the deployment of Filipino troops to Vietnam. And on this basis, the PKP, which had been in an intimate alliance with Macapagal, broke with Macapagal, declared their support for Marcos, and campaigned for him. Central to this was Jose Maria Sison future head of the CPP. Uh, CISON organized the support from the youth wing, the Capitan Macabayan for Marcos, a fact that he has attempted subsequently to erase from history. Within two weeks of the election, in an interview with Stanley Carnow of the Washington Post, Marcos announced, many of us felt that the United States was preparing to withdraw from Vietnam. But now that the United States has demonstrated this resolute will to slug it out, we've been reassured. And he promised that he would be deploying Filipino troops to Vietnam, reversing his stance within two weeks. Interestingly, a side note, but one can't help but note, Marcos's campaign slogan 1965 was that he would, quote, make the Philippines great again. Right-wing populists are not a particularly imaginative bunch. 1967, a memo, this sort of sets the tone for the split in a memo from Marshall Wright of the National Security Council to National Security Advisor Walt Rostow. He wrote, it would be nearly impossible to overestimate the gravity of the problems with which our next ambassador to Manila must deal. It has become commonplace for people knowledgeable on the Philippines to predict a vast social upheaval in the near future. There is widespread talk that the current president will be the last popularly elected Philippine chief executive. There was one more election, Marcos was re-elected, but this was correct. He was the last popularly elected Philippine chief executive until 1986. Many high level American officials considered the Philippines to be the most serious and the most bleak threat that we face in Asia. That's a staggering statement. Think of what that entails, 1967, the peak of the cultural revolution in China, uh, Vietnam, uh, the level of sort of social instability in Asia and the National Security Council is saying, the Philippines is, we got problems. So this is a period of immense social upheaval. Uh, shortly before Wright wrote this memo, Marcos's forces opened fire on peasant demonstrators. They were part of a, a millenarian cult uh, 
uh, armed with amulets and, uh, and bolos, uh, not with guns, and killed 33 of them in the streets of Manila. Uh, there were protests of uh, an explosive character, the first of which took place in 66, as I'm about to deal with. It was these social tensions that tore through the contradiction at the heart of Stalinism, at the core of the PKP, and split it into two rival factions along the fault lines of the Sino-Soviet dispute. In other words, and I'll get back to this in my conclusion, but to preview, it was not either domestic disputes or external machinations, but rather the same heightened global social tensions that were accelerating the Sino-Soviet dispute in the core simultaneously was producing social unrest in countries around the world, Paris of 68, et cetera, the rise of authoritarian regimes, Suharto, et cetera. This period of revolutionary upheaval and authoritarianism tore through communist parties around the globe, splintering them along the fault lines of the Sino-Soviet dispute. It is the shared geopolitical and global context of class struggle and upheaval that gave the Sino-Soviet dispute its international character. The protests in the Philippines were over the course of 1966 bound up with the question of the war in Vietnam. Young people in the Philippines, as young people around the globe, were shocked by the televised brutality of America's war, by the hypocrisies of it, by the trampling underfoot of the uh, national sovereignty of the Vietnamese people, et cetera. All of these terms were being widely used by young people in Berkeley, California, and in Manila, Philippines, and every country in between. The PKP, however, had not only supported Marcos in 1965, they had quietly entered into his cabinet. Members of the Central Committee were working in the offices of Juan Ponce Enrile, who was the right-hand man of Marcos. They were reluctant to break with Marcos, but at the same time, they needed to retain a hold over the youth movement. Their youth, youth them. Their usefulness to the Marcos administration rested in their hold over a mass movement. If they lost their hold over the mass movement, they lost their political value to Marcos. But to retain a hold over the mass movement increasingly required speaking out against the war in Vietnam, which required speaking out against Marcos's deployment of troops. You're caught in an insoluble conundrum. Over the course of 1966, the party was silent on the war in Vietnam and its front organizations, the Kabatang Makabayan, the Young People's Organization in particular, the Nationalist Youth, silent. They did not denounce Marcos's deployment of troops, not until October, 1966. It was in August, 1966, that the battle lines for the future break began to be drawn along the geopolitical fault lines of the Sino-Soviet split. In July of 1966, Sison, a leading member of the PKP and head of the youth organization, traveled to Japan for the 12th Jinsuikyo World Congress on Atomic and Hydrogen Bombs. This is a fascinating historical moment for the Sino-Soviet split from the periphery in, in a great many countries, because it was is a, this seemingly somewhat innocuous com, uh, Congress a Congress opposed to the proliferation of nuclear weapons but that was connected to front organizations of the Japanese Communist Party. That a number of delegates from a number of countries throughout the global South secretly entered China. It was in late July, 1966. The dates are extraordinary. Uh, the Japanese Communist Party, as a result of the slaughter of the PKI and what they saw as the CCP's culpability in this, uh, because the CCP had recently instructed the Japanese Communist Party similarly to engage in armed conflict, uh, broke with the CCP and reoriented toward Moscow, refusing to accept the Chinese Communist delegation to this Congress. A majority of the delegations to this Congress, including Joma Sison, walked out in protest and then secretly traveled to Beijing. They arrived in Beijing on August 6, 1966, the day before Mao had issued his Bombard the Headquarters poster at Peking University. It's an extraordinary moment. It is the launching of the Cultural Revolution. And for two weeks, as Mao met with the Red Guard, uh, all of the delegates of the future representatives of the parties that would split along the lines of the Sino-Soviet dispute 
were present. They were hailed as uh, the revolutionary representatives of the proletariat and peasantry. There was a gathering staged by Cho and Lai on their behalf where 10,000 people gathered to celebrate them and sang the East is Red. Um, it was in this moment that I think the, uh, the character of the Lin Biao phase of Maoism, protracted people's war, the Yan'an of world revolution and the cultural revolution was disseminated. Uh, in the wake of the slaughter of the PKI. Joma Sison took these ideas back to the Philippines. Events came to a head when Lyndon Baines Johnson, October 24, 1966, traveled to Manila for the Manila summit. The goal of this summit, which was secretly orchestrated by Johnson, but presented as if it came from Marcos, uh, was, in the words of the Philippines Free Press, the entire firepower of the American delegation during the summit was concentrated on changing the complexion of the war in Vietnam from an American war to a war of, by, and for Asians. The entire thing was orchestrated by Johnson, staged in the Manila Hotel, uh, the Grand Dam of American colonialism on the, on the waters of Manila Bay, and uh, in a bizarre and macabre coincidence, an American freighter collided with a Philippine ship the day that the Manila summit opened. And um, I believe over 60 Filipinos drowned and their bodies were floating in the Manila Bay during the staging of the Manila Bay summit outside the MacArthur windows of uh, Johnson's suite. The uh, youth organized in the PKP around Joma Sison where finally the muzzle was taken off and there was an explosion of protest outside the Manila Bay, outside the Manila hotel and the Manila summit and it was brutally suppressed by the police uh, on orders both from Marcos and from plainclothes US officials. In the wake of this, all of the social tensions that had been percolating beneath the surface emerged. The young people that were the base of political support for Joma Sison uh, were looking to continue to protest, no longer protesting the Manila summit, but police brutality. Um, and Sison, needing to retain this as a base of his own political support, sought to corral these protests behind the program of nationalism. He delivered a speech at Ateneo University on December 6, 1966, in which he said there is a need to wage a nationalist education campaign. The events before, during, and after the October 24th incident reveal to us how much our government officials misunderstand the spirit of nationalism. Anti-nationalism has so much poisoned the minds of so many of our police officers and those higher executive officials who give them the orders. Now I could go on in quoting this speech, but Sison's point is, the, isn't, he wasn't making the classic Marxist point that the police are the armed bodies enforcing the state which serves the interests of the ruling class. He was saying, look, they've been miseducated by anti-nationalism and we need a nationalist education campaign so that they understand that they have a common set of interests with the protesting youth. He was not, and this is the critical point, instigating the leftward movement of youth and workers. He was tail ending it. He was seeking to constrain it as his base of political support, but it was pulling him in a particular uh, and increasingly radical direction. There were consequences as a result. Uh, an investigation into the police brutality station in the Philippine legislature very rapidly turned into an investigation of alleged communist influence among the protesters and singled out was Jose Maria Sison. You can see him here from the Manila Chronicle where he faces prosecution. Uh, the, the, uh, at the center of this was the man in the black suit, Carmelo Barbero, a man who rose to power as a smuggler, became a legislator and was bound up with the uh, prosecuting of communists and alleged communists in a series of witch hunts in 1966. What's interesting, and I'll get back to this in two slides. What is interesting is that Carmelo Barbero, while he was the leading voice attacking alleged communists and actual communists, and to be a communist was a criminal offense, and to be a communist leader was a capital offense at this point. The Communist Party was outlawed, despite the fact that it had been allied with the former president and was now allied with the current president. Uh, there was a sort of universal hypocrisy in this game. Uh, Carmelo Barbero, the leading witch hunter, was closely tied to the opening of ties with the Soviet Union. His daughter studied at Patrice Lumumba University. Every visiting Soviet scholar that came to the country stayed in the home of Carmelo Barbero, the leading anti-communist witch hunter. 
It emerged during these investigations uh, staged in the legislature that a large contingent of students and professors were scheduled to travel to China. Here you see three editorial cartoons, November 18, November 24, and December 10 from the Manila Chronicle. Red China is luring Filipino students away as a Pied Piper. The Filipino student is defying his mother, the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the defiance of mother is uh, particularly egregious. Uh, on behalf of the sneaky Mao hiding behind the door. And finally, these students are running roughshod over uh, the foreign office. Uh, this is actually rather far from the case. They had been invited, their visit had been approved uh, by the Marcos administration prior to the protests of October 24. In the wake of the protests, Marcos shut down the intended travel and declared that no one would be allowed to travel to uh, China, not even tenured professors at the various universities. But while the Marcos administration was shutting down all travel to China, in particular because of the Cultural Revolution, which is increasingly becoming, the world internationally was increasingly becoming aware of the character of the Cultural Revolution, the Marcos administration was, through other elements in the PKP, conducting informal diplomacy with the Soviet Union. This man here, Teodosio Lansang, is a very interesting figure. Uh, in the late 1940s, he traveled to China where he was present for the founding of the PRC in October 1949. Uh, he was responsible for Tagalog language broadcasts of Radio Peking before he was moved to Moscow prior to the Sino-Soviet split. He was in the Soviet Union over the course of the Sino-Soviet split in the late 1950s, early 1960s. His return to the Philippines in January 1967 was orchestrated behind the scenes by the Marcos administration as a means of opening informal diplomacy with Moscow to secure loans from the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, as well as a market for Philippine sugar and other agricultural products. He was facilitated in this by other figures, William and Celia Pomeroy, former heads of the PKP now in exile in London or in, in England, and Ruben Torres, a figure who was instrumental in this and played a critical role in the Marcos administration, a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and also a salaried government official in the uh, offices of Juan Ponce and Rile. The Marcos administration had a loyal wing of the party that was looking to secure ties with the Soviet Union as Marcos was increasingly making machinations toward military rule. In fact, the party, as I demonstrated in my book, Drama of Dictatorship, was instrumental in facilitating this. The unified PKP with these wings torn apart by diverging social interests made one last united attempt at uh, a political uh, campaign in February 1967 with the foundation of the Movement for the Advancement of Nationalism, MAN. The function of MAN, unlike say the uh, front organizations of the party in labor or in the peasants or the youth, the function of MAN was a relationship between the various front organizations of the party in these sectors with the national bourgeoisie, with capitalist interests. This was the culmination of all of those efforts and they worked tirelessly to create this organization. This is from the program of the founding of man. The names are small and they wouldn't mean much to most of the audience, but if you look through them carefully, it's a very interesting mix. It's senators, congressmen, uh, neither tied, tied to the communist party in no way, except by a loose alliance. It's what would be the central committee of the future PKP, the Moscow wing. It's central members, founding members of the CPP, the Beijing wing, and it's business interests. The head of a, a nationwide chain of pawn shops. Uh, workers tend to not be fond of pawn shops, but there you are, pawn shops. Uh, and uh, business interests tied to banking, etc. All of them merged together in this organization. It was in the wake of the founding of man that the party tore itself apart. Both sides made a scramble to seize power. The CPP failed, or the future CPP failed, and was expelled in April 1967. They published a statement in the Peking Review in June 9, written on May 1, that declared Mao Zedong's thought lights up the whole world, committed to an uncompromising struggle against modern revisionism with the Soviet revisionist ruling clique at its center. That was the founding principle of the CPP, opposition to modern revisionism. That is to say the line of the Soviet Union. The critical question 
for the now expelled members around Jose Maria Sison, and it wasn't simply Sison, there was a sizable chunk of the party that was expelled. And the founding of a new party was the formation of an alliance with a section of the ruling elite, of a section of the capitalist class. This was intrinsic to their program, the block of four classes. This was what was the critical element prior to the founding of the CPP. The PKP had an alliance with Marcos. Sison sought to retain ties with Marcos over the space of about six months after the expulsion, writing a friendly letter to the president. Again, an event that he has attempted to bury. Eventually, however, the party found new allies, in particular, the figure Ninoy Aquino, who even for those outside Philippine politics are probably familiar with the tensions between Aquino and Marcos. Um, and it is here that we see another element of the Sino-Soviet split and how rivalries aligned. While figures like Marcos sought to use ties with the Soviet Union to consolidate their hold on power as they moved towards authoritarian rule in a time of social unrest, figures like Aquino, on the other hand, were the excluded opposition in a time of social unrest. They too sought dictatorship. Aquino was very explicit that he would impose martial law if he succeeded in getting into power. The problem for Aquino was he needed to be in power first. In my book, The Drama of Dictatorship, I have referred to these layers as the conspiring understudies. Marcos is our lead actor, but there are the conspiring understudies who are looking to remove him and play the lead role of dictator themselves. The line of Beijing at this point, armed struggle throughout the countryside of the world, but an alliance with a section of the capitalist class. These two facets merged in the interests of these conspiring understudies. The restive opposition among the capitalist class in a time of social up upheaval. It is in this context that Nino Aquino facilitates the founding of the Communist Party and ties with the New People's Army uh, from various uh, former hook guerrillas. The founding document of the party declared armed with invincible Mao Zedong thought, the Communist Party of the Philippines will surely triumph and the Filipino people and the leadership of the revolutionary proletariat will achieve people's democracy first and socialism next. It's outside the, the sort of the confines of this particular talk, but my forthcoming book, The Drama of Dictatorship, deals with the next period, 1969, the founding of the CPP to the declaration of martial law and the machinations of the PKP, the Moscow party, which staged bombings on behalf of the Marcos administration to justify martial law with the complicity of the president and wrote the documents justifying military dictatorship. And the CPP, on the other hand, which directed all of the unrest and protests of the time behind Aquino. When martial law was imposed, over 60,000 people were arrested for political reasons for the first five years of the Marcos dictatorship. The majority of these were not communists. They were not members of the political elite. They were ordinary workers and peasants. Mao, however, and this is my final slide, Mao, however, and the interests of the Chinese Communist Party because of the heightened tensions of the Sino-Soviet dispute, which had turned into an armed conflict in the Xinjiang region, border, borderlands of China and the Soviet Union, uh, sought the support of Kissinger and Nixon as a counterweight to uh, the threat of the Soviet Union and reigned in Lin Biao, altered the line of the party from protracted people's war to the three worlds theory uh, in which the Soviet Union and the United States were the two first world powers and were the great enemy of the peoples of the world uh, and sought to form alliances of his own with autocrats. This became the policy of the CCP. And thus uh, with the uh, rise to power of Pinochet and the crushing of the Chilean communist party, the Chinese communist party immediately welcomed Pinochet for the Chilean Communist Party had had ties with the Soviet Union. In a similar fashion, uh, when Marcos sought to open ties with China in 1974, uh, Mao welcomed Imelda Marcos, September 1974. You can see him here kissing Imelda Marcos's hand. Uh, and Joe Masison, now head of the CPP, wrote a statement in the flagship publication of the Communist Party, heralding the visit of Imelda Marcos to the Chinese Communist Party, to Beijing, as a diplomatic victory for the People's Republic of China, a victory for the Philippine revolutionary struggle. In 1975, formal diplomatic ties between the Philippines and China were opened. Mao met with Ferdinand Marcos 
Marcos declared while in China that he would be crushing uh, dissidents in the Philippines, and no one in China made any attempt to countermand him. They would not intervene in these internal affairs. And thus, the PKP was now in the cabinet of the Martial Law Administration, and the CPP was isolated. The Sino-Soviet split had split the Communist Party of the Philippines in two in a period of increasing social unrest, and now it was unmoored from Beijing, but it was set, it was set in motion by the political line that was articulated from 65 to 70. By looking at the Sino-Soviet split from the periphery, we see a number of things. One, that it is a shared global conflict that is leading to these tensions, that brings about a set of aligned rivalries. That this is disseminated not simply along hub and spokes, but through a mesh of ties throughout the periphery. It also calls us to sort of reevaluate the sort of bipolar narrative of the Cold War. Ferdinand Marcos, was a critical ally of Washington. And yet, here we see him allied to a communist party and conducting informal diplomacy with the Soviet Union from 1965 through the 1970s. Uh, it indicates that to an extent, the critical question for us in understanding the development of the Sino-Soviet split and the global Cold War is not to follow the map of geopolitics, but the map of the class struggle. For this, I think, is the decisive question that underlies the Sino-Soviet dispute and the tensions that it gave rise to and that it expressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. This is really a rich and detailed discussion. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of historical episodes to explore. Um, so I'm gonna open it up now to a question and answer. Um, I'd like to give the priority to any of our guests who are in the Philippines right now for the first questions, because I know that it's very late there. Um, so if anyone has stayed up this late um, to follow the talk, I I'd like to give you the first opportunity to ask a question. However, if you want to wait, that's fine as well. But um, the way we'll do this is you can use the raise your hand function, um, and then I'll call on you to uh, unmute and show your face. Um, if you're having difficulty using that, I noticed there's a, a lot of people uh, using the phone option today. If you have a question and you can't get my attention, wait till there's a gap in the speech and then um, just announce that you have a question. Uh, but let's start with people who may raise their hand first. Does anyone want to start us with a question now? Joseph, while people are waiting to formulate their thoughts, I'll start with a question, a very naive question. I'm a Southeast Asianist, but not a Philippine scholar. Um, and I found um, your descriptions of Marcos to be so interesting, you know, um, because the way we as non-experts imagine Marcos really comes as a kind of set of caricatures in some sense, right? And so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what your research tells us about Marcos and the way in which he kind of moved effortlessly, it seems, between all of these kinds of positions that seem to be polar opposites to the rest of us, right? Um, and one, what does that say about Marcos as an individual, but also maybe how does that reveal something about these binaries that we often see as so, you know, such polar irreconcilable opposites, but perhaps they're not really such opposites after all or something like that yes it's a terrific question i mean worthy of a talk in its own right i suppose it's a common remark but it's true uh there uh, a, a very famous filipino author by the name of jose pitlacaba uh writing i believe in 1971 characterized the um the dispute in the elite uh in which one camp was oriented around marcos and another around aquino and the opposition uh, and he said, if one did have to give this a sort of class character, one would see this as a divide between the Anshan and the Nouveau in the oligarchy. And the Anshan is a Kinoan company. This is old established money, ties to Spanish colonialism, American imperialism, many of them leading collaborators during the Japanese occupation, large landed estates and so on and so forth. The forces around Marcos and Marcos himself, and this is critical to understanding the psychology of the man, were uh, the nouveau riche, 
uh, they were the new industrial interests and so on. This is not to say that they were poorer by any means and Marcos enriched himself extraordinarily, but they were frowned upon in the best of circumstances by the Anshan, excluded, scorned. The Anshan, and this is true of this, this sort of social layer around the world, consolidated its interest through incestuous intermarriage uh, and sort of keeping it all within the family, et cetera. There's a bit of a weed eater noise outside, I apologize. Um, and Marcos resented this and brought to bear in his sort of character, the quintessence of the nouveau, self-construction. He was forever obsessed with the creation of a persona and he was brilliant at it. He was cunning, conniving and absolutely brutal. Uh, one of the most famous early stories from Marcos's career is that his father's political rival was murdered in his home, shot through his head while brushing his teeth. And Marcos was convicted of the murder. Mm. Um, and Marcos was put on sentence, subject to life imprisonment, and then was going to be subject to the death penalty. But he was also at the time a graduate of the law school and was taking the bar. And while in prison, and this is a somewhat legendary story, while in prison, he aced the bar, mm. getting the number one score in the country that year. <laughs> and wrote a three volume appeal to the Supreme Court asking them to throw out the charges against him, which was upheld, not so much on legal grounds, but because behind the scenes, people said it wouldn't look good to have the number one lawyer in the country subject to the death penalty. And so a political deal was reached and Marcos was released. This was his rise to national prominence. Deserved in some ways, but also at the same time revealing of the level of brutality and Machiavellianism that he would resort to. He then concocted a persona by uh, creating a story of having medals of honor and so on and so forth. He would turn on anyone who was not immediately useful to him. We see this again and again and again. And we see this not only domestically, but internationally. And Marcos was extremely able, not simply at working with the United States, but working the United States. There's a wonderful book uh, called Waltzing with a Dictator by Raymond Bonner that demonstrates how the Marcoses knew the ins and outs of American politics. They contributed a million dollars stolen from the coffers of the Philippine state to the re-election of Richard Nixon. Amazing, um, huge contributor. More money went from the Philippines to Richard Nixon's re-election than went from the United States to Marcos's. So there's that element. And while playing that, Marcos was able also to reach out to the Soviet Union. I think that persona of self-construction uh, and that willingness to do effectively anything in his political rise is uh, the critical character of Marcos and the class interests he represented. Thank you, that was fascinating. Um, I see there's a hand up from Matthias Fibiger, and if I've mispronounced your name, please say it properly for me. Sure, uh, you got it almost right, it's Fibiger. Um, thanks Joseph for what I thought was a really fascinating talk. It inspired a lot of questions uh, from my end, but I just to limit myself to one. Um, I wonder if you could spend a little bit more time explaining how the Philippine communist movement interpreted the, the collapse, the crushing of the Indonesian communist movement, because it seems to me that it could play out in one of two directions. On the one hand, this crushing of the PKI may discredit the parliamentary peaceful road to socialism that had been embraced by the PKI. But on the other hand, it may discredit the allegiance with Beijing that had also been embraced by the PKI. Uh, so I wonder if you could just say a little bit about how that debate unfolded within the Philippine communist movement, because this seems fundamental to your argument and perhaps uh, quite contingent as well. That's a terrific question um, because it is such a critical question for every communist party. As I mentioned in passing, the Japanese Communist Party had to grapple with this question and it precipitated the shift in their allegiance. This was true for every communist party around the globe. Uh, the events in Indonesia were absolutely shocking and required an assessment. Um, internally, the discussions within the PKP uh, likely polarized around uh, opposition to Beijing on the one hand, uh, and the need to follow the line of Moscow. So there was that. But publicly, it was written by Sison himself, who became the head of the Beijing party. Sison, or the Beijing oriented party. Sison wrote a, uh, a statement assessing the events in Indonesia, which he published in the mainstream press in the leading news weekly uh, of the Philippines, the Philippines Free Press, 
1966. He had a sense of the scale of what had occurred in Indonesia. He referred to nearly a million dead. And then he wrote a political assessment. And his political assessment was that this was the opening of a revolutionary period in Indonesia. An extraordinary claim, historically seen. Uh, but one in keeping with this sort of voluntarism of Maoism, uh, you know, the paper tigers and whatnot, uh, sort of it's all in the willpower. And his claim was that for every dead Indonesian communist, there were four aggrieved family members and friends who would rise up. And that in taking power, Nasution and Suharto had made several critical mistakes. And among those, he claimed, they had alienated certain layers of the national bourgeoisie who had been tied to Sukarno. Again, that, that, that class, the national bourgeoisie, that faction of the capitalist class. And as a result, these layers would be driven to armed struggle. Sison genuinely thought in 1966, in the middle of 1966, with nearly a million dead members of the PKI, that, quote, the struggle for power in Indonesia is far from over. One doesn't forget a line like that. The struggle for power in Indonesia was over for a very long time. Uh, it did not really reemerge until the 1990s, one might say. And when it did, there was not a communist party on the landscape to speak of. Sison's argument, however, was in keeping with the perspective of the CPP, which he founded in 68, 69, which claimed martial law is good for revolution. Fascist dictatorship is good for revolution. This remains the line of the party. Uh, I gave a lecture in March at Berkeley uh, on the subject of a, a bombing in the Philippines in 1971, analyzed the events and its significance. And at the time, uh, I was denounced furiously by the, China, by the Communist Party of the Philippines and by Joma Sison. And Sison made a speech the week that I gave my lecture in which he said, and I quote, the best thing that can happen for the Philippine revolution is for Duterte to impose a fascist dictatorship. He will be finished in a year or two. This, there's a continuity here. Repression breeds resistance. And so the line of Sison and the formative layers of the CPP was that the repression in Indonesia would foment and accelerate a revolutionary upheaval. It's a fundamentally bankrupt perspective, uh, in my opinion, and one that in some ways says that the best communist is a dead communist. It's a terrifying perspective, but that was the response to the events in 65, 66 in the Philippines. Uh, we have a question from Adrian Vergara. Can you hear me? Uh... Yes, we can hear you great. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm actually from I'm actually a graduate student from the Philippines and I recently read Dr. Scalise's work uh, earlier earlier this year. It's his dissertation. Sorry, I sorry to jump in. I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, is it possible to get a little closer to the mic perhaps? Okay, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So I read your dissertation earlier this year. My question is less about the presentation and more about your scholarship on, on the Philippine communist movement as a whole. Because recently, uh, I'm sure you're aware of Rigoberto Tiglao. I have seen him selectively cite your research to push forward a certain narrative that, justice, yes. just, that justifies martial law. How do you feel about this as a scholar? And as a scholar, how does one defend his work Against, against the co-optation to promote certain narratives that justifies authoritarianism? Yes. Thank you very much for that question. Let me, let me explain the context of the question for the larger audience and then respond to it. Uh, I, but I appreciate this opportunity to uh, present my own perspective uh, as it's a critical question. Um, history in any country has profound resonances, but seldom is that quite as clear as in the Philippines around the question of martial law, a question which will not go away, uh, particularly with the rise of Duterte. Now, uh, a former leading member of the Communist Party named Bobby Tiglao, he was the head of the Manila Rizal Regional Council of the Communist Party in the 19, early 1970s. 
uh, subsequently broke with the party, uh, became ambassador to Greece under the Arroyo administration, and then a very prominent apologist for the Duterte administration on the front page of the Manila Times over the course of the last four or five years. Uh, this, another point that I guess should be made for an international audience, uh, the character of the Duterte administration has been one of unbridled authoritarianism and death squads. Uh, the estimates are hard to come by, but it seems likely that over 30,000 people have been killed by the uh, death squads unleashed by the Duterte administration since 2016, a staggering figure, one that uh, begins to raise questions of genocide. Uh, it's a, it is an extraordinary figure. Uh, and de Glau, uh, drawing on my doctoral dissertation, which he cited on the front page of the Times in a series on the so-called Scalise revelations, uh, cited my scholarship and pointed out correctly that I had highlighted a relationship between Nino Aquino, the opposition figure, and the Communist Party, and then included, concluded, fundamentally twisting my analysis, that martial law was therefore warranted and justified. Uh, something that I have fundamentally opposed. Anyone who reads my scholarship knows that I respond with horror to the martial law administration uh, and that my scholarship is dedicated to a remarkable extent for a scholar to trying to use history as a means of preventing the recurrence of such events. Um, I have repeatedly spoken out against this on Facebook and so on. Uh, I don't have a front page column in the Manila Times with which to trumpet my perspective. Uh, but I published a statement that was widely circulated just a couple days ago because Tiglao was once again coming to the fore because Bong Bong Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has effectively announced his candidacy for president of the Philippines and is terrifying to say a viable candidate uh, in the sense of could get elected. And one of the key components of the social media launch of his campaign was to misuse my doctoral dissertation uh, to claim that martial law was warranted. Uh, no scholar wants to be in such a position. My doctoral dissertation has now been downloaded almost 15,000 times uh, for very, very strange reasons. So allow me to respond, having created the context. I fundamentally and without any reservation denounce the misuse of my scholarship uh, to in any way claim that martial law was justified. What Tiglau scandalously leaves out is that Marcos was himself allied to a communist party. And that's a critical element of my analysis. Uh, and then attempts to twist this into a justification for military dictatorship. My entire argument is how dictatorship can be avoided. And my point is that the two rival communist parties allied with the rival contenders for the throne subordinate the entire movement and defense of democracy behind the aspirants to dictatorship. It was this, this diffusal and betrayal of the movement for the defense of democracy behind anti-democratic forces that in the end made martial law possible. To oppose the threat of dictatorship, I would argue there is the need for the political independence of workers from every layer that's looking to coordinate some new form of authoritarianism. And that is my response to Diglao and the apologists for Marcos. And thanks for the chance to clarify that. Thank you for that clear response and the context. It's uh, fascinating and uh, clearly uh, at the center of a lot of discussion in the contemporary Philippines. Yes, um, does anyone want to ask any further questions?